Welcome back everybody. This is going to be a quick video. I want to do a series that talks about active control, PIDs, PIDs, uh, and, and how your flight controller uses them to control your quadcopter. Active control is used quite often in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes we're the computer that does the active control. For instance, when you're driving a car. There are many of the same procedures in place. It has to do with the way that you make use of the accelerator to maintain speed and the steering wheel to maintain direction. An airplane such as this one requires uh, a slightly larger amount of active control by the pilot to not only maintain direction but to maintain altitude. Even though airplanes are inherently stable, if you let go of the controls that will roughly fly, you still have to guide it to where it's going. This is one of the things that I do when I'm not flying quadcopters. This is me flying a Schweitzer 269C. Helicopters are inherently unstable. If I let go of the controls in this helicopter, it will just want to turn itself over and crash. It requires a higher level of active control from the pilot to maintain level flight and to make it go where you want it to go. Some aircraft have autopilots that assist you with this. In this case, this is a Robinson R44. It does not have that, so it still requires a pretty significant amount of active control to fly it. You can't just let go of the controls on an aircraft like this, but it gets worse. This is an F-117 aircraft. It was designed to be stealthy, but the compromise for that was aerodynamically it's uh, quite unstable. This aircraft requires enhancement by flight controllers to make it stable enough for a pilot to be able to control it. As we progress here, we're getting more and more into aircraft that are inherently unstable, and aeronautical engineers or aerodynamic engineers would start to call them flying rocks, where they don't really have any aerodynamic capabilities in them, that they rely more and more upon electronics and enhancement to help the pilot be able to control it. Quadcopters are a perfect example of a flying rock. There's nothing aerodynamic about them whatsoever except for the propellers. There's four points of thrust that we have to control independently to make this react the way we want it to react. This is done mostly through the electronics and the flight controller and through pit loops. This is a black box recording of one of my quadcopters in a hover. You can see that this quadcopter is definitely a new to the tune based on the oscillations that it has, but that's not the point here. It is doing what it can to maintain flight in space based on what I want it to do or what I'm commanding it to do. It has control independently of the four motors and it makes those do whatever they need to do to accomplish the goal that I'm sending it. To simplify the concept of a pit loop, I would like to make use of the cruise control in a typical car because it's much more simple. It only has control of one engine and it's really only looking at one sensor to make it work and to make its decision about what to do. When you set your speed on a cruise control, you're telling it that you have a desired outcome. Maybe it's 60 miles per hour. On a quadcopter, we do this by changing the control sticks. Perhaps we're looking for a particular roll rate. Some cars are set up with large engines that have a lot of horsepower and possibly even in a very light frame. Some cars have very small engines and might take a while to accelerate. The amount of throttle that's required to accomplish our goal of accelerating or decelerating is going to be different from car to car. The P gain is the first thing that's looked at in a pit loop. The P takes a look at what the sensors are giving us, in the case of the cruise control, is what is our current speed, and it also looks at the desired outcome, what is our desired speed, and then it comes up with a guess as to how much change we're going to have to make, for instance, to the engine or to the throttle to make that goal happen. Now, if it's programmed properly, it should get us pretty darn close to our goal. In an ideal world, the P would be tuned to accommodate the car that you have. If the engine is big, it might need less throttle change. If the engine is small, it's probably going to need more throttle change. In your quadcopter, it's the same thing. How fast is it reacting to the inputs that we give it? Is it too fast? Is it too slow? That's why we can adjust it. 
If we were going to do a tuning on the PID loops for cruise control, the first thing we would look at is the P. We would want P to get as close as we could possibly get to how much throttle it requires to accomplish the goal. Too much and it's going to overshoot it, too little and it's not going to ever get there. And it's going to vary from car to car depending on its horsepower and on its weight, but we'd want to do this under ideal conditions, for instance, on level ground. I is the next thing that's looked at in a pit loop. It stands for integral. It watches what's happening. It makes sure that the correction that P is giving is actually getting the job done. For instance, if we're going up a hill in the car, the amount of throttle that P decided would be appropriate to make the change may not be enough. So I is looking at that saying, hey, this isn't happening. We need to actually add a little bit more throttle. Why don't we do that? When you're tuning the I, if you increase the eye, sometimes eye gets a little bit big-headed and it'll have a little bit too much control over what's going on. You'll feel like you have less control. If you reduce it too much, it doesn't get to do its job. Finally, there's the D gain. It stands for derivative. It looks at what's happening so far and it looks at the desired outcome, for instance, 60 miles an hour, and it says, wow, we're coming up on that really, really fast, and I don't feel like we're going to be able to stop in time and we're going to overshoot it. So it has the ability to throw a little bit of correction in there to compensate for that. When we control the D gains, we give it more or less control over the correction that it wants to make. Together, the P, the I, and the D are summed together to produce a final outcome of what should be happening. If they're properly tuned, the outcome should be pretty near perfect. But even if it isn't, it's a loop, so it'll go back and it'll start all over again and figure out what needs to happen. I do hope this is helpful to you. If you see any problems in the information I'm giving here, please let me know in the comment section, and if I need to, I'll make a follow-up video. In the next video, we'll start talking about uh, adjustments to specific things like P, I, and D. I know this has been done a million times, but I think that it needs to be simplified. Please let me know if you have any other comments. I will see you in the next video. Thank you.